Right, this is going to be another episode of Banter Give a Go. Technically, for this season, this is the last one, in it? Because we're into the summer now. Actually, it's already international basketball. But because, obviously, the season's spread across the year, we will do more in the year. And also, it just depends on our schedules. If we can find the right time. I could, we could also think up now that we've done a whole bunch of episodes. And crucially, we might have more of a sense of what each other thinks. I think we could also find some really interesting historical stuff in the off-season, potentially, if we have, like, a week spare. Or the other angle, obviously. I've teased it before. Maybe we bring people like Lerpis on and go, OK, then, tell us why. LeBron is so wonderful and then let him go and then a bit of pushback you know we can maybe do that too so okay let's start here Maui what are your just basic big picture thoughts at the end of the finals what do you think about mm. how the season ended uh, that for I feel like it's always we always find ourselves in a position after the finals where the team that just won the finals we say okay how long can they keep doing this I feel like, for example, for example, the Nuggets before, it kind of felt like, wow, well, Jokic is just going to keep steamrolling people. But then we kind of see this season, the inconsistencies in some of the players that are around him. And for me, the same question goes for the Celtics. But what's a great, what, what seems to be optimistic about their future is that I don't, I, I just see if they can keep the duo well, they of Jalen Brown. Yeah, if they keep yeah. Jalen Brown and they keep uh, Jason Tatum together, and as long as they stay a very well GM team, which they have been, by the way, for the last five, oh, six, seven they're years, job, yeah. they're, then I don't, I see that, I see that they're always going to be competing. And on top of that, another thing is that the Nuggets are always fighting out of the West, whereas yep. the Celtics are fighting out of the East. And for my money, in terms of off-season roster moves, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about oh, after this. It's all to the West again, as usual. <laughs> yeah, the West are making all the big it's moves. It's always is. Yeah. It's, it's just in the East, like, what's even happened? Like, is Tyrese Halliburton getting any different kind of help? Is is Brunson going to get anybody new, really, for the Cel or for the Knicks? You know, like, there's there's so many more bit blockbuster moves that are happening in the West where everybody's trying to one-up each other. It's like, who can get out of the West? But it feels to me like the conversation for the East is it's a, a, a bit more tepid. People are just simply not as interested in making those those huge moves. And I don't know I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's the just, just by chance of the owners that are over there and the kind of money that they have. But for me, the Celtics, if you had to ask me right now who is who are the favorites to win the upcoming the upcoming finals, I feel like the safe pick, and this is what I did, by the way, in maybe two episodes on this podcast. I said, I said, you know, I like what the Timberwolves are doing right now, but if you just said, if it, with the Kassad line, Jesus is watching, gun to your head, who are you going to pick? I mean, I just have to say the Celtics again. They're the most likely to make it out of the East, and then everybody in the West is just going to cannibalize each other once again. And um, to speak on the the West side of things, I mean, I mean, well, what do you what do you think of that? Do you think the Celtics yeah, okay. are, are destined for it? But it is where I actually think this is where people because you know this from Counter Strike. The worst thing when a team appears to choke or a superstar underperforms is the little fourteen year old goes, <laughs> he just sucks, and they think that means forever he'll never win. And so the joke is, you know this, Maui, one second before Astralis ever won that major, every CS fan who thinks they know ball would have bet their life Astralis will never win a major. Their logic is they can't ever win. They're all chokers, they'll all fail. But the joke is the second they won, because famously I called it with Anders, they all just went, but they were technically number one in the rankings. They had just won each year. It's like, fuck off. So the same thing, right? Because the Celtics, like, first of all, they should have been in the finals the last three years. They just fucked up that one last year, obviously. And then obviously the one before that, Tatum claims he had a broken hand or injured wrist, and he obviously under performed in the finals, right? And Nuggets played great. So I think when you go... Uh, no, there was one before that. The Warriors, the, yeah, the Warriors. Yeah, the Warriors. It was the last Warriors yeah. one. So if you look at those ones, the problem is, because on paper, then it looks like they're sort of like a failed dynasty. I think this is where people ignored that, like... They could have won all those years, though. And so to me, yeah. when I look at the team, crucially, this is actually one of my theories, aside from we can get to the Tate and Brown thing if you want in a minute. But one of the reasons I have a theory as to why people hate this team is because it's boring when they win because the modern NBA is all hero ball. I am Michael Jordan. They want one guy. They want him yeah. to be Luca. They want Luca to shoot 30 shots a game and go, fuck you. Like I told you, and do, yeah, then they do something like that. They don't want Tatum to, to not be shooting well, penetrate, kick the ball out, great ball movement and get an easy shot and keep beating you and then play great defense and shut you down. And then you just win easy, easy. And you even could have swept. Like, I think fans hate that. That's, they want, they, I think they want NBA to be like, 
NBA 2K and they're playing the game. It's my career mode, you know. So, of course, when you've got fucking prime LeBron, you don't pass it. You just fucking do all the shit you want to do. You just, you just take Kyrie Irving and fucking go through everyone. Like, that's fun to them because they're immature. So, unfortunately, I do think the part they're missing, because they're going to think the same thing, Maui. They're going to think, yeah, but this one's just because, like, Luca was injured and, you know, like, maybe if the Wolves didn't upset the Nuggets or even worse, the worst take you could ever summon right this moment would go like this. It's just because of all those injuries in the East, like, you fucking balls or they would have still beaten all those teams. Like, maybe one of them could have gone to a five game or six game, but it would have won all those series. Like, that's the joke. Like, so to me, I think the biggest problem when people look at this team is one, they do still hate on Tatum and Brown to some degree. Because let's be real, neither of them are the best player in the NBA. But their team right. is dope, and how are you, Maui? The part people won't realize is because people always talk about teams like one entity as what exists the whole time. Well, the other thing is, if you go and look when they first began this run, they didn't have the same set of players. They've done moves in the in the meantime, and I think that Drew Holiday signing is so fucking shrewd. By the way, this is one of those guys that'll never get his due from the fans, but he just goes and wins, mate. He's just a fucking great piece, because as long as he's not one of your one or two option, that's just found money, dude. That's like, you love having a player like that, so I think when you look at the signings they've done over this time to keep the roster super stacked, I think it's implied, Maui. This team could be in the finals slash win the championship, like probably for the next two or three years. Like this, if they play it right, this could be the dynasty. And the joke right now is this. I'll add the one last detail. It's why I referenced Astralis earlier. Boys, if you're hated on the Celtics, you better fucking get on your hands and knees and pray Tatum never gets it together, mate. Because if he ever turns it on like my boy Device did, then it is over. Then he, then we're talking like multiple rings. Then you won't even be able to make fun of him. Then he'll be in the finals MVP, et cetera, et cetera. Because the other thing about this team was, I'll tell you what, mate, if my superstar shoots and plays like shit, like everyone's going to say about he did because his numbers, right? Yeah, but he still played team ball the whole time. Like, he's fucking... He actually would, like, set people up. He would draw attention. Like, that's what I want you to do if you're having a bad game, you know? But it's where my beloved Kobe Bryant, like, the Pistons file didn't do that. He's fucking hero ball shot all the time. So he would <laughs> only win doing Michael Jordan shit, you know? You can hate on Tatum, but as a team, the Celtics is a fucking good team. And as I say, that take has aged so badly of, like... It's just because the other teams aren't good. Like, no, here's the dumb thing. I said this maybe eight, three or four episodes ago. To me, I would favor the Nuggets to win the championship because I thought they were the best in the West. And I think Jokic is almost unguardable. He's just so fucking good. But if it's not them, it had to be the Celtics for me. Because I just look at the, top, the roster. It's so deep as well. Like, I think they also underrated. They have a crazy starting lineup. But then the bench has got players too. Like, this GM job for real should be studied for years. This is a masterclass. Definitely. The and and the thing with the Drew Holiday move is that like when you're losing Marcus Smart, who won Defensive Player of the yep. Year, and you're looking for a replacement, I mean, there's just what a banger! It was, I think it had to be the best possible. Yeah, it's yeah. insane, isn't it? Uh, the also the the fact that it, it's it's so important in the NBA to make a couple moves that just cash in on a guy that has low stock from the rest of the yes. scene, and that was also Chris Stops for this season for the yeah. Celtics too. Like he was. I mean, oh, yeah, and remember, the, the they won so easily. They didn't even have him most of the time, bro. What if he's healthy? I know. You know what I mean? I Same know. thing. What if he's it, healthy? It, I know. If he if he was able to play full minutes, this would have been dominant. Yeah, I really feel it could like. have been. Yeah, this, That's why the sad I mean, thing he, is, dude, I really wish it had just been the Nuggets versus them, but everyone at full strength. I think that would have been a yeah. series for the ages, you know. Yeah, that's like the one thing that's always always weird about just traditional sports in general is just that by the end of it all, there's always a team that's bruised and battered, yeah. and like that's the kind of that's kind of the worst part about any traditional sport oh, is. is just injuries. It's by the way, like, it, I'm not joking. Yeah. It's why American football has to be BO1 because bro, uh, yeah, it does. No, almost no one ever gets to the Super Bowl with all the starters like healthy. It's mad, isn't it? It's actually one of the stupidest sports ever because in history you look back, <laughs> yeah. but you won't know how many people were injured or some sub couldn't play or the running back was injured. Yeah, you know, oh, it's mad. But basketball. Like, I also, don't you notice that, Maui? That's one thing I find weird. The angle in the modern day is all they're all better athletes. Do they get injured way more? Am I missing something? Like, I feel like people are permanently out with like superstar players. I to, to to just to just like I think uh, the thing is I don't think human bodies were supposed to move as fast as these modern athletes okay. are doing. I I think they're they're jumping higher. They're la they're hitting each other harder. They're like they're also hit landing oh, right. on each other with more weight. To you, it's like, like the logic if, of baseball pitchers, where if you're a baseball pitcher, they say you don't retire. Your arm just wears out because you do like an unnatural movement like a million times, and eventually yeah. your arm just breaks. You're not supposed to do that like eight billion times. So that's like your concept. They're just doing too many moves. It's like Could it's they? like we improve cars' engines without improving the safety. Right. That's basically right. Yeah. Oh, they got no yeah, brakes. People are, just, people are just getting blown up now. <laughs> sure. Like, 
Yeah, like when when Embiid falls on your knee or something, or like if he falls on your leg, that shit's just breaking. Like your your bones oh, are no. not stronger than they were from. Like the only thing you have more of is calcium, I guess. Like there's no way to make your bones. I don't think I'm okay. I don't know the science behind it, but I don't think you can make your bone just stronger than men's bones from 30 years ago when all of your opponents weigh like 50 pounds less. Sure. Oh so, yeah. What about yeah. um? What do you think of the whole Tatum Brown thing? What's your take? Oh. Okay, yeah. For Tatum Brown, I mean, it was pretty, it was evident within the, I'd say, two games in, I would say that I was already pretty heavily in favor of Brown over Tatum. Uh, I feel like the he was just way more efficient as an overall player in terms of his matchups. They both, they both sometimes guarded Luka. I, I felt like Jalen Brown in the early games was a uh, overall better defensive player than Tatum. I know that yeah, Tatum, Tatum and everybody on the Celtics, they're always going to do a little bit of trying to get their own and also playing the right team ball. And I feel like w what's interesting is that is there was this line that happened, I think, when it was like a mic'd up segment in one of the games where Tatum was like, was like, all right, guys, like just everybody um, don't you don't have to do the step back three. Just everybody look for their shot and everything like that. And for the most part, like, yeah, the Celtics do that to a high degree. But I did I did notice that Tatum sometimes took it upon himself if the play wasn't really going that well with, say, not even like three seconds left on the shot clock, but eight seconds left or so, or nine seconds left. He would just take a step back three, and oh, it was he like, heaved a lot. Okay, he heaved a you lot, just yeah. you just you just told everybody to not sure. do that, and you didn't even look for the next pass to do that. And so that was actually what I think happened in Game Four, especially. I felt like it was a lot more hero ball from the Celtics. They stopped trying as hard, and and that's when some of like the bad parts of Tatum really showed up, where it was just like, okay, you're just chucking because your whole team right now is too lazy to play the motion offense that you absolutely need to play if you want to beat the Mavs in a convincing fashion and that's what they did for four out of the five games in this series and beyond that man Tate I mean Brown Brown seriously has just improved upon all just the things that, just yeah it, 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 it maybe like three four years ago especially when he played the Warriors like it, it was like he could only drive to one side I don't really I don't even uh, admit, admittedly I think it was that he could only go left it's and like then he, now I think it's like he can't dribble with the left hand or something one of the two oh. right, isn't it something like that like he's not good yeah, at dribbling yeah. with the other one but now, by the way if that's even true it doesn't matter he's fucking fine no yeah no the thing is that with, with this with these finals I don't I don't remember Who anymore because I just I, it was so obvious before three, two years ago three years ago but now I'm like what what hand can't he dribble with because because yes. now he's just taking he's like driving really well he's attacking really well especially when there's space created through the offense uh his his mid-range is really solid too he's not like going for those Kawhi Kawhi Leonard-esque kind of like like bad quote-unquote bad shots but he's still taking some mid-range shots and he's hitting them with a pretty high degree his ability to find separation because he does this like sometimes he gets like kind of towards the top of the key and he does this little pivot spin and he does like a fadeaway shot and it looks it looks damn good. It looks it. I'm not gonna say it's as clean as the as Luca's necessarily in the series was, but it's very under control, and he gets a lot of space because he actually just jumps farther when he does it than Luca does. Luca somehow seems to always get separation because he bumps the guy. Like I actually think Brown's aesthetically looks a lot better because he he just gets yes. that natural separation instead of having to actually push into his defender as much. So I I mean overall for me with the Celtics, I mean Tatum's the better overall player still for my money if i wanted someone for the regular season i would still take tatum over brown but for these finals to me i think it was pretty obvious through i'd say maybe other than a little bit of hesitation in game five i think game five i think i think tatum was looking pretty sharp for a while but it was like the first two three games were still etched into my brain that i was like okay this is all brown all day for me yeah, on the Tatum thing, that's why I say to me, if anything, the potential hasn't even been fully maxed out with this squad. Like, if they get it together even more and someone like Tatum just plays better in these series, like they're going to be even more dominant because the other thing is, the one critique I would have of Tatum isn't like he missed. Like, if you miss, you miss. People have bad series. The critique I would have is this. He knew he was going to win anyway from the way the Celtics were playing. And so in line with what you're saying and all the, like, Literally, like, I made the joke that he did it once with the, like, jobs not finish. But, like, it's like he actually had the bucket list of things you say when you win the championship. Because he did the Kevin Garnett one. He did the Michael Jordan. Oh. He did the Kobe. And so it's like during the match, you know, it's the same critique I made of Cadian. He didn't want to just win. He wanted to be finals MVP and he wanted to check off everything on that list. He wanted to do Kevin Garnett. He wanted to do Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan. Crack. He wanted to do it all because he in the, he thought he was the central character in the movie. Because I agree with you, but he is the best player. But his problem was he wasn't playing that well and his other dude nicked the MVP from him. He was playing better. 
he, he absolutely outplayed him. But I, that's the other problem, because this actually does tie, if we go in a minute, to the USA shit. People are outraged that Jalen Brown didn't get on the USA team. It's like, bro, motherfucker, oh, yeah. before this playoffs began, you wouldn't have put him on the team. You're just now doing that thing where if you win finals MVP, you pretend he's the best player in the world. Like, it doesn't always work that way. It's a fucking, it's based on one series even. Although he did also win, obviously, the East, uh, Eastern Conference Finals one. But that was like a glop he had. <laughs> yeah. And he was particularly clutch this time around. So, no, I think people have hated way too much. And on the Brown one, I've got a point to make on that one, which is this is why another thing where I notice people are just really inexperienced with basketball, or maybe they just never played it or studied it. Maybe they just watch very casually and they, you know, they, they, it's like I used to say about Counter-Strike, there's a type of person who I used to call an R-word who just wants to watch the fireworks. They just watch the crosshair shoot people in the head. They don't look, well, why was that shot easier? Because he positioned this way, conditioned the opponent to be on that spot. They flashed him off. They don't know any of that. They just see he took the duel and he won it, right? And so I think a problem in the modern days, a lot of young fans think every good player has a complete game and it's like bro there's almost no one has a complete game that's why when someone actually does master the game and get the everything they have like the mid-range bag the three the defense the passing the cut when someone does that that's why we revere them and consider them the absolute best players so when you're talking about that like the idea he was limited because people kept saying that and it was all just like a it was like a reddit type thing to repeat like whatever like he can't use one of his hands it's like why would he need to you cretin you know and first of all 99 percent of basketball players don't shoot with the other hand that's already a fact right there oh yeah you shoot with the one hand and you shoot in the same form secondly like what that implies to me is that i think they've been playing the nba basketball game too much again because the worst thing about playing against star players is they dictate to you the action in fact one of the things i've found fascinating from watching like people who actually break down specific moves is really good offensive players usually literally look at where like the feet of the defender is so when they see you shift the balance one way now it doesn't matter if you oh, block him on his left. now with yours he can go right every time because your weight, balance of weight is over here or you put a foot up and now we can run past because you've only got one foot on the ground or you jump and now he has time to move around like someone like brown what you've seen here is he hasn't got a masterful game but he has mastered his current skill set he knows exactly like you're saying where to get a bucket when to get a bucket and he was really consistent in his finals like i actually do think you could even make the case even though i've criticized him in the rest of the episodes we've done about this playoffs look if you want to be extremely strict you could actually make the case Doncic was overall the best player in the series even like he still did do really well and sort of whatever injury he had it didn't really look like it affected him too much but the thing is because the Celtics team was so good Jill and Brown just was stayed in the cut mate he just did his job fabulously this is a great fucking team effort I thought it was dope I yeah I feel like if you if you're a secondhand guy is like I mean, when I think of second guys, like, throughout history, like the Scottie Pippins, uh, even kind of what Clay was to Curry, yeah. it always feels like they're kind of missing some sort of skill set. Yep. Um, like, even even Kyrie to LeBron when they were on the Cavs and everything, like, like they're all they're all deficient in one in one part. But really, the thing, the thing that's so brilliant about about Brown is that he's not really deficient. He's just a little bit less efficient than Tatum is usually throughout the whole season like they still both have very strong skill sets yep. they're both great wing defenders they're both they're both quite good off the dribble they can both actually pass pretty well they can both they all have like they have such a composite strong skill set and that's kind of I think probably one of the first episodes we did of this show I kind of said one thing about Tatum is that he's sort of a jack of all trades master of none because it's like he's so he really is just good at everything and I don't really know if I were to nitpick it just kind of be like uh, you know, he could he could hit like three more percent from three or something like that. Or he could, you know, his 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 mid range could be a little bit better. And that's that's what's beautiful about their synergy is that if one of them's kind of having a slightly off day, the other guy between Brown and Tatum it can just kind of shore up all of the other players' weaknesses and just kind of yes. because they're probably not going to have a bad game. Also, it, yes. it's it's just like they're 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 really it's really interesting because the narratives for such a long time were like, can they coexist? And it's like. <laughs> Like, the this is fabulously. the dream. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, yeah, this is the dream. If you got exactly. two good wing players like yes. this, like this is exactly what you. If you could basically construct a team of of five of the same player, you would kind of want five Tatum's. You would want five Browns, and they're kind of both on the same team together. So yeah, the synergy is great, and I'm kind of I'm glad that also um, there's just been stuff that's been revealed about their history together over time, where it's like yeah. the fact that Jalen Brown and and Tatum used to just be like the, for whatever reason Brown Brown said they used to always be like bunk bed mates or whatever, and they were. When they were in camps and stuff. Oh, it's like it a movie, like, in it? It's dope, yeah. Yeah, 
It's really cool how yeah. they have just been together for so long. And I know the media is trying to like always pull them apart and Gosh. try to separate them. But really, like this is one of those blame F config duos where actually it's not even that because they're they have different skill sets that work together on a team. It's almost just like if you got two of the it's like if you got one guy and you clone him. Well, <laughs> now you have two two great yes. top 10 players in the league. No, no, my, my final comment on this final goes like this. That's the genius of the GMing, as well as it being deep, and the whole team, by the way, being focused on defense as well. Your stars play defense, and because they're both these similar types of attacking players, you can only defend one at a time. You can always pass to the other guy. That's actually OP as fuck. And the last thing I'll say is this. I will say one narrative that also died on its ass in these finals is all those people who were trying to like, torture the stats to make the Mavs look like, like Doncic had the best defense or whatever that didn't make it to the finals i'll tell you that right and meanwhile the celtics again in the most boring fashion just fucking shut these guys down like that's why I, this is why i get why the nba abused it and made the fucking sport about just making threes now because the problem is it's like i've made this point in the past when someone scores and you score and i score it feels like one of those boxing matches where no one's playing defense we're just both punching each other in the head it's exciting right when you both play awesome defense you're denying you the pleasure of seeing the ball go in. So it feels frustrating. It feels like, oh, this is whack. Oh, that's unfair. And so I think people actually are just bored by the way the Celtics play. But I'll tell you what, the fucking Mavs weren't bored by it. I bet they were really frustrated in a different way, <laughs> mate. Because that looked like a nightmare. Because by the way, the Celtics were giving me vibes like the fucking old Spurs and stuff. Like again, like the whole team dynamics are so sick. The way they play together. Everyone's making the right plays and playing efficiently. Oh, it's dope. It's fucking sick. If you're a fan of the whole sport as opposed to just players, this is a, this was a beautiful performance. I just hope, like I said, next season, let's get the Nuggets there. Because actually, that's one thing we could touch on. Since earlier on, one team we did focus on was the Clippers. How sad is that that they've already broken it apart? Look, I know it never oh ever worked God. because they could never all be healthy at the same time. But yeah. even this year, where they almost took turns to like be healthy in a game in series, <laughs> even that almost implied like there was something there, dude. Like, but if people don't know, like Paul George is going, what's the rest book ain't gonna be there? And like, it's fuck, it's basically over. Like that dream just died. It was a one season thing. It was a one season thing. Yeah, and, and and like also, I mean, Kawhi's out for Team USA. I'm not really. I don't. I don't, really I, dive... don't you don't you start to wonder on him, dude, if he's ever properly coming back? I get like I. You remember that period before Anthony Davis got healthy with the Lakers, where he used to just be like criminal every season. You wait for him to break down. I'm so scared Kawhi's career is just going to be like mega limited, mate. It feels like he's never going to play 70 games. He's never going to make it to a whole playoffs. There's even that thing, I don't know if you ever saw those videos, where people even implied, like, he might actually have fucked knees. Have you ever seen how he, like, hangs and then yeah. really gently lets himself out? It's like, oh, mate, I'm, I'm scared. Because he used to I be know. a freak athlete, didn't he? He had, like, a crazy frame. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those things that uh, draw into question just where you would even put Kawhi in, like, an all-time greatest conversation because he makes it so awkward. It's just, like his peaks are so insanely high like when he's when he's on his game he's a top five player in the league but if he'd never just... been injured mate i actually think his physique and his skill set is one of the best ever for basketball like he'd be yeah. dope on both sides of the ball it seems like he doesn't have a big ego he could have been fucking incredible but one of the most injury pro players i've ever seen i th i think i i it's it, in when he's playing his absolute best i don't know if there's a better perimeter slash wing defender like i mean yes the whole thing about him getting the first finals mvp on the spurs was that he was the guy that slowed down lebron which is funnily enough like it's actually sad narrative. they didn't play more though isn't it that's another thing mate i actually think yeah. he would have been the best player ever to constantly go against prime LeBron. that would have been dope to see that battle yeah Especially because even back then lebron used to play defense that would have been a pretty cool head to head He's he was one of the only people that also could make KD feel awkward, too. Because yep. he, he had those so huge good. hands, fucking, yeah, of course, massive yeah, arm, his, wingspan. His, yeah, his wingspan and his hand size was just so good at disrupting yes. those kinds of players. He could also, he also was just so, he, he was so coordinated with his hands when he's trying to poke it away from somebody. Like, if Giannis was going for a drive, too, he could find a way to just kind of slip his hand in there, tap it away from him, and then now he's just going for his own fast break on the other end. Yeah, I, no, the Clippers situation is dire. I mean, I, I don't even know where you... I don't really know where you go go here because it's it's just it's it, it, like to to see the team fall apart like this is just it's just such a tease. You, you never really got to see them going like when they were playing together. They were on a really nice win streak yep. in the middle. People of the are going to forget the season, man. There was that bit in the season where they were like unironically un un like, a top two team in the NBA. So they were wild, weren't they? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm I'm really I'm super disappointed with how that one fell apart because it felt like they were kind of the dark horse to make it through the West because of of the potential of the roster. But then, yeah, no, the injuries are always just going to mar them so, so greatly. And uh, like, I, I don't I, I almost feel like there's there's a lot of interest. There's like some interesting landing. Where, do you know? So Westbrook right now. Is, do we know his landing? As far spot? as I know, that's even one where he might be in that same spot as after. Like, it sounds like not a lot of people want him, mate. Or maybe you want. I, I, here's the other thing people forget: the last few of his deals, he's taken way less money than he probably should have, like for his, his yeah. legacy. So I, I actually wonder where the fuck he's going. Because to me, if you, I think, I think there's two ways you go. You either just go to a team and you play out for legacy and get points and you get a big payday again, or you have to try and join a contender. Like, what, what else are you doing? If this, being stuck in the middle seems like the nightmare to me. But I have no idea who wants him at this point. I, I feel like everyone's sort of soured on Westbrook. I was never a fan anyway. But the joke is, like with people like Nico, I have to end up going the other way and go, he is still fucking good, though. He's obviously should yeah, be in the yeah. NBA for fuck's sake and starter. Like, can we have him in a team, please? You know? <laughs> yeah, I would say he's like, to me... I mean, what he did with the Clippers after looking so bad on the Lakers to me was redemption. And yeah, so it should be. that raises stock pretty greatly. And I feel like anybody right now should look at Westbrook and be like, this guy could run our second unit. Like he's, he's prime, prime to do that. He's definitely, I don't, I mean, I don't think he's a top 30 point guard in the league, but he's definitely a top 50 point guard in the league. So I feel like that's, that's right for the taking right there. And yes, he's still, when he locks in on defense, I'm not, and be, on limited minutes, I, I've seen him actually do some pretty good work there i'm not going to go as far as lucas stands and say like look at the numbers it's crazy it's like nah, i don't i don't really think it is i've just seen it so nah i i'm overall one of the biggest disappointments of the season all in all for the clippers uh and beyond that just Kawhi himself is just like what what are we is there anything to build around there because like if i'm a gm i'm, I'm gonna be honest like i kind of said before Kawhi is kind of this perfect piece if you're a GM to extend your career as a, because you're just going to be like, well, we have a guy that if he's healthy, he can be one of the best players in the league. But when he's unhealthy, well, we're just unlucky. I, I think I've actually kind of changed how I feel about that because if I'm a GM, I just wouldn't take the risk anymore because he's even having to bow out of the Olympics too. It's like this guy just can't play 20 games straight. Like that's just not possible. And to win, to win an NBA finals, you have to play 20 games straight. At least you have to, you have to have very minimal load management. Once you reach that part of the season. By the way, I've got one thing to throw out since obviously we just finished up the Clippers talk. Have you ever seen that weird thing? It's a really peculiar idiosyncrasy of newer players who are joining the NBA that when people ask them, who is who is your GOAT? Obviously, the standard one is LeBron. Co there are some of them say Paul George. And you're all going to laugh immediately. <laughs> but here's what's funny about that, Maui. I know what they mean, right? First of all, they don't seem to understand GOAT means like, you know, literally the best player ever. And you have the accomplishments and chips. So for example, he has no chips. So it doesn't fucking matter in that one. But I sort of know what they mean, Maui. If I was a young player, actually, Paul George has a really well-rounded game. And by the way, he used to be a fucking real stud on defense too. Like if you're just looking at like someone to aspire to in the bond, like a couple of years ago, he was really cooking, mate. Like that one time when he had like no one help in the playoffs, he was like averaging like 30, five or something like he could ball his problem is i've always seen I, i'll just be straight up i think he's a little bit of a pussy that's actually why i think he's a dope podcast or he's just a really nice guy but it just seems like a bit of a pussy cat you know what i mean doesn't seem like, like he's got that killer instinct i think he was a very skilled player though his peak the the yeah i remember hearing something like that i, I think it might have even been from someone like brown or something it was like someone he, famous yeah it yeah, was some like new really... like top draft pick or something mental yeah <laughs> yeah, it was a top wing player that said something along the lines of Paul George is who they look up to the most. And it was, yeah, and it was like, I mean, it's kind of like if uh, for Counter-Strike players, why so many people were like, try to play like Device. Don't try oh, to sure. play like Simple. Yes. Because it's like, I couldn't, I couldn't be Kobe. Like, yes. I don't, I don't, like, I'm not, I I'm not that vicious about my work ethic, but I, I, I do have the Device work ethic, just work smarter, not harder. And so that's kind of the Paul George way of thinking about things, which I think, I think if people really explain their thought process for why they pick Paul George in those yeah. kinds of situations, Paul George himself would be like, but I do work hard, but, but I am trying my absolute hardest. I'm not, I'm not slacking or anything like that. But then, then again, he does have a podcast, which he uploads like every week too. So it's kind of like, eh, you, you maybe, you maybe could use that time elsewhere, but uh, no, he's kind of shoring up his future, I think. But yeah, no, I, I think Paul George is one of those, another one of those players where it's, uh, it's kind of like if he didn't play in an era with Kawhi, Durant, and um, 
Oh, it's a giga stacked era, yeah. Of he would he would have he would have been one of the best small forwards of all yeah. time. But no, no, but dude, he just, he, he just, he's on yeah. some like I don't know Dominique Wilkins shit. Where it's like you're really good too, but I'm sorry, like you played in the where all the fucking goats are. Like, what do you want? Yeah, yeah. you don't have any chips. You, you're never gonna get the credit from the kids. Yeah, sorry. Probably sorry. just the fourth best small forward in an era where the small forward position felt exactly. like the most overpowered one. Because by the way, I do agree as well. Point. If you look at how the NBA changed, actually, it is small forward that's been the OP position for like a decade now, for real. Yeah, that's the stack. Yeah. Role, of course. Especially because remember, technically, you're supposed to list like Durant and all them as that role. I know they don't really play that role. I always say like LeBron and them don't really play a small forward, but they're still listed on it. When you're doing the NBA All Star game and all NBA, they're going to put you in that fucking role. So if you're Paul George, how are you going to get all first teams? It's going to be fucking hard, isn't it? It's going to be really right. hard. Yeah, yeah. They, I've got a question for you. Oh, go on. Oh, yeah. Finish up. Oh yeah, well, thankfully for the for those All NBA awards in the last what was it two years or something, they made it that it was like backcourt frontcourt because honestly, yes, like, that's way better. They, it, yeah, because they has. I think that it was because. Well, Joakim Noah was pretty good, but I think some people did look at Joakim Noah getting center one time and were like, "Is that guy really the fifth best top five player in the league?" It's just because you know? he was listed as center. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas, like, yeah, well, you're right. The, the joke is at that era there would have been some shooting guard who's like way doper than fucking Joakim Noah, but he's just behind <laughs> Kobe and D Wade or something. You know what I mean? Like, how is he supposed yeah. to get in the game? Here's an obvious <laughs> topic to ask you about, bro. This is a meme. I make fun of LeBron and the fact that I think LeBron is le GM and has controlled his oh, career to oh an extent I think is mental. This is like he actually himself leaned into the main bro. Because now it looks, I'm just going to say, it, I don't think there's even a conspiracy. I think the whole reason he did that podcast was literally to build up JJ Reddick and then make him the coach and spoiler. I know they're going to say JJ Reddick has got... That's like your puppet. You know what I mean? That's like your, like, the, like, put it this way. This is actually a decent analogy. It's nothing to do with the war, right? You might not know this, but you know Putin's been the president or whatever of Russia, like, all these times. There was one period in the middle where to make it look like he wasn't the president or a dictator, he let another guy be the president for, like, four years or something. And then, but everyone said that he was just controlling him the whole time. That's all he's going to do. Like, what do you think of this move? I think it's wild, man. It's one of the craziest fucking meme moves ever. So, JJ Reddick is the coach of the Lakers. What do you think? <sighs> the... The, I, I feel like the thing is that a lot of these NBA players don't let on to maybe how much they do know. And the thing about Reddick is that I feel like I have to try to separate his media personality, which to me has been... At first, it was kind of refreshing at the very beginning when he was kind of like calling out Stephen A. Smith. He's like, Stephen A. Because I think everybody re remembers that Mark Cuban clip where he calls yeah, yeah. out Skip Bayless for, sure. for what did we do? What did we do, Skip, to make it hard for LeBron? You know, yes. stuff like that. And then he actually went over some of the, the schemes and the way that they played that made it difficult. And the thing is that Reddick, when he first joined ESPN, was on, on that tip where he was kind of like, like Stephen A, you're you're just kind of waffling, and like here's why, here's yes. why, and then it was cool, but then he kind of like got really sucked into the fact that like I are smarter than the media because I I am yeah. self aware, and it was just like bro, like like you're still perpetuating every single facet of this, so don't think you're any different from it. And then now it's like it's kind of cool because he's putting his money where his mouth is, That's and I true. feel like it's sort of. It's sort of like a, it's sort of like what Kassad was doing for the last couple of years before he started working with yeah, Reed, yeah. where he was just kind of like, he's just kind of talking a lot of shit. He's and put I everyone that was to awesome. write and tell them all off. Yeah, sure. So, so I kind of, in a way, I don't, I'm not going to say I root for JJ Reddick because I didn't enjoy what his personality became overall, but the whole like Le GM thing is pretty obvious there too, that LeBron saw a figurehead that wanted, that had a lot to prove. And then he just said to him, like, Hey, we should probably team up. We should you you should become the coach of the Lakers. But the problem is that LeBron doesn't play with any coach for more than really two years yep. ever. He's just, he's yep. just like he's just just going through them all one by one. Just like yep. I'm done with you. I'm done with That's you. Just the scapegoat. And I don't really. That's their job. Yeah, it, it kind of <laughs> he kind of they kind of are the scapegoats because it's also yes. like LeBron. They're just gonna play LeBron ball course, anyways. It's not like like what? Why do you even really need to keep working through all these coaches? If yep. anything, the the organization that you're playing for should just get the cheapest possible coach. You, as a figurehead, you just coach overall, yep. and then just and then and it doesn't need to be like this. But I don't I don't know why he keeps doing these kinds of things. I thought I honestly thought when you were bringing this whole topic up, you were going to talk about the Bronny James stuff. 
Uh, we yeah. could do that if you want. I would just say this one other thing. That's actually, I'm going to do a video. I, I shouldn't even do this because sadly, one reason why I don't tell people what I'm going to do normally is then you'll just get one not a dickhead who forgets it's free content. It'll just message you constantly if you haven't done it within a week. Like, where's that video? What about that video? He says, like, you know, I'm, I'm basically doing this at my grace. Not like your fucking, it's not an order. It's free, you dickhead. You don't even pay for it. So I'll probably yeah. one day do a video because I, I actually think about it. It is important to be like intellectually honest. So one day I'm going to do a video. I might even do one for CS, but I won't hint which person that's for. For I'm going to do an NBA channel, a video on my side channel. It's going to be called something like the LeBron Steel Man. And I will make a case for LeBron as the GOAT. By the way, I don't think he's the GOAT. He's not on my list. But I could make a way better argument than all these dickhead LeBron fans. Because I'll tell you what, Maui, even though LeBron is partially to blame for this, there's an angle for it on the coaching one, which is two things. One, people like Michael Jordan did not have the power to do fire and hire coaches like Michael Jordan, like uh, LeBron does. So I can't actually know, by the way, if, if Michael Jordan would have exercised that power. I know everyone now thinks, but he wouldn't. Michael Jordan is a bit of a dickhead, guys. He maybe would have. By the way, my boy Kobe Bryant might have done it too. You know what I mean? Like these people, if they'd really had that full power, they might have also put a cycle of people that they thought were the hot shit, grass is greener logic, you know. But actually the biggest argument, if you wanted to say, like why didn't LeBron, if you think he's not as good, accomplish as much as Michael or Kobe, one of the number ones is, where's his coaches. His best coach is Alex Spolstra, right? No one's arguing Alex Spolstra's yeah, better than yeah. Phil Jackson or, fuck, you know what I mean? Like, that's never even been a discussion or like fucking Pat Riley or something. Like, no one's ever made that argument. So I actually do think that is an obvious thing lacking in his career because I do think a problem with LeBron's career is playing LeBron ball and this is what they now blame the coaches for. Then the rest of the players around him not playing that well or shit in the bed or not having any fucking place in the team or just getting left out. Like, I actually think that's a very good case you could make. It's like, actually, even though he might have been responsible for it, he hasn't had good coaching, mate. I think that's one of the biggest flaws of his career. He should have tried for real to get to like a Popovich or something like that. Like if he'd have got to one of them, he could have just fucking stayed in the cot and won a Lord of Rings. I know. It's like the same thing with Nico. I just, yep, I like, agree. You got all this power. Why are you not getting somebody yeah, that exactly. can actually create a real system? Like, yes. Because the whole thing that was so impressive about Jordan working at, at Jordan and Kobe working with Jackson is that they tried Ryan, running the triangle. And then they, you know, they would run that for three and a half quarters. And then in the final six minutes, they take over. That's the, that's what makes it so exciting about the way that they played. It was like a good system that, so that they would just stay in the game, get everybody involved, make everybody feel worthwhile. And then all of a sudden, you know, if they need to be called upon a la Steve Kerr yep. or something, then they felt like, you know, they've been there for long enough. But if it's now like LeBron ball, LeBron ball is like, is like, you know, I'm taking, it's more like I'm taking three quarters at 70% speed. You guys do a little bit more. And then I'm going to pass you the ball in the most important moment, but you're not going to know about it. Cause it's not yep. a play that's drawn up. True. It's that it's that I couldn't find my shot and you need to be ready on that corner yep. or else we're losing this game. And so I wish, I wish there was a little bit more going on. And I, I think that's one thing that, um, it almost, it almost in a weird way, it kind of diminishes what, how, how successful Curry was as an individual player, because he just played curveball, which is like motion offense. You know, he's setting sometimes the back screens. He's yep. setting, he's setting the decoy up so that clay could get the shot or, Dur or most famously it was Durant that was getting the shot when they were winning those finals back to back. So that's something that's probably going to hurt in, in terms of if Curry just took the whole, like kobe jordan mentality oh, if he, he went to a, if he this. went to a bad team bro that that didn't even have any specialist offense just had a normal pass the basketball offense you know the the point guard yeah. brings it up dude if he'd what? wanted to be an arsehole he could have averaged bonkers numbers like the joke is if he wanted to be he should probably take 15 threes a game you know what i mean like i even would tell him yeah. why take two just take take all the threes like he could have gone i agree people actually diminish him because of Kerr, but that's because he won the championships thanks to that guy but if he wanted to just be an individual like oh Mount Rushmore player, Curry could probably could have done it on a bad team. I think so. Yeah, right. yeah definitely. Yeah, people would he could have been one of the greatest what ifs, and yes. people would have been like, Oh, he doesn't the, actually it's crazy to think about this to even because because I know what the narratives would be in advance. Oh, they were him, on of course. <laughs> if he were on something like the Knicks or whatever, he's like, Oh, he's just trying to play hero ball all the time. He yep. doesn't play winning defense, he doesn't do this. Is he coming on for the yeah, it's the same narratives they used for him. Oh, yeah, exactly. They would just say the same things about yeah. Carmelo. They'd be ripping into him like crazy. Yep. And he probably would have a comp I bet you actually Curry Curry seems like he's like he's a good egg. Like he wouldn't have he wouldn't have really turned against fans right. and he turns against people. But there's a there's a real possibility that after 
a decade in Nick's media of them just losing. Wait, draft, does a heel like, turn. turn contrastingly? Yeah, he does a heel turn and is like, "Fuck it, I'm just winning scoring titles." I would love to. I, I don't give key, a shit. Low key, this is toxic, but I would love to see it. Like, I, like obviously, yeah, I the joke is, in a way, I actually am glad that Kobe had those years where he had absolute dog shit rosters because he just could shoot. <laughs> he had the ultimate green light, bro. Like, if you yeah. if you were in that NBA 2K mode, like I was, that was when I first started watching basketball. Seriously, obviously, I could just watch my dude every night score forty. It was it was fucking sick. <laughs> we lost the game half the time. But it was it was great to watch him. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah curry curry would have just been that guy in this generation but thank god i'm gonna say thank god that he got a good coach because no, if that were just because the mark jackson era of offense with him was just so bad it was like one pass maybe one pick yes. and then a roll or something and instead they like that's why that's why curry's the the coach of like every single national team yep. because everybody sees the offense that he gets out of the warriors by the way, I even think, because we've backed into this, I even think that's the hidden thread in NBA history people don't consider. Because I always point out that people have a big flaw, which is they often have like what you call single factor analysis. They pick one thing, rings, points, efficiency, whatever it is that their thing is, they pick that, right? Well, actually, if you look in NBA history, the craziest thing, Maui, is this. Actually, if you look at players, even great players aren't that good a guy as to who's going to have the most rings. It's coaches. The greatest coaches yeah. of all time have all the rings, boys. Like, those are the guys where, like I say, especially, by the way, if you're not actually the number one option, you better get to that guy. Like, if you are a second or third option, like, the best example is probably, like, Pau Gasol. Bro, Pau Gasol would not even be a name mentioned if he hadn't have joined the Lakers. If he'd stayed on the Grizzlies, yeah. like, even if they'd have gotten good like they did with his brother, he would have been considered, like, you know, like, again, like, what the fucking fourth best power forward who would be like a, an occasional all-star and everyone would just go like he never he already won two playoff series and it'd be like that wouldn't it he did never had this career because he got to phil jackson and corby he gets to get rings and now yep. and now people do that mad shit where now they're almost like putting him like a, a, an inch below fucking like dirk and like kevin garnett and shit it's like what what yeah because that's some like are you out your mind bro and listen i like the things but that was, you're out your mind on that take like what <laughs> it's it's why it's why NBA front offices generally they they look at players just kind of like if we can get any of these people at this level of this level of stardom we've talked about this on previous shows where it's just like it's more important to just have a very top heavy team than like a balanced team necessarily the Celtics being one of the rarest exceptions ever where it's like they have so many people that are kind of on that like not the S tier but the A tier that it just makes up for the fact that they don't have an S tier player and then they also have a good coach in on top of that fact like it's it's so rare but that's probably why actually Missoula has a chance to go down in history as one of the greatest because he's really young as a coach right now yeah, yeah. and he did it without without a superstar like i mean yep, he did it without agreed. like a like an you know like an all he didn't, well, he, I think t- even, even though people yeah. said it, it, it was an mvp yeah, kind of, he never yeah. really was it we were never going to pick no. him you know but he didn't have any of those top 3 players for sure yeah he didn't have that's any yeah that's why i mean i mean he doesn't have a yeah, he doesn't yeah. have like an ascendant superstar yes. he has a he has a he d- i guess i would i would call Tatum a superstar actually if I really got down on paper it, down people this is what people keep forgetting again it's the device thing he played badly in the finals in fact he's done that twice yeah. now if you yeah, watch exactly. the regular season he is he probably is the fifth, fifth best player of the NBA in the season you know like I think people are now hating too much on him I'm with you though that coach the other thing about him is he's a really fascinating guy too like he's really interested in interviews mate he's given like his vibe I love it it's like a little bit prickly but quite professional still he clearly has like the team ball co- I love that guy I think he's, he seems really interested in me I also love how I'm not gonna lie. I actually, he's younger. He's like, he's uh, what is he, 35 or something like that? And he, when I watch him on the sideline, I'm like, that's probably how I would dress as a coach. He's just wearing a crew neck sweater every single time, and just his his outfit compared to so many of those coaches in in past years that wore the whole like the <laughs> suit. The, I'll do the the, the, the button. This yeah. guy is fucking five years younger than me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm exactly, saying, I'm just exactly. Saying. When I see, and that's the thing, when I see him play, or when I see him on the sideline, I'm like, oh, dude, he's wearing comfortable clothing. Sure. Like, I think that's something my generation. Oh, he's is, always wearing like, warm-ups so and shit and hoodies and that. Yeah, true. true. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's yeah. like, dude, haven't you watched these coaches sure. of all? Because if I, I the, the one thing is like, if I were an NBA coach, I'd feel so pressured to just get these like really like kind of loose fitting suits that I can like, you know, yep. gesticulate with like crazy. Yeah. But he has no problem with that wearing a crew neck. Like he looks so super cozy all the time. It's like, that's one of those things also where it's like you, you know people dress up like that so they feel like they can gain respect but he just yep. knows that what he's saying is probably so valuable yes. he can wear a crew neck no i it's I, like I, the, I take the same yeah. lead i actually think this is he's so confident that he knows ball and he's got buy-in he doesn't need to wear the suit he's not trying to no, do exactly. it for the cameras yeah i'm with you yeah I'm with you yeah 
What about this? The, the, yeah. There's yeah. one last little topic I thought we could do because it's more actually of a meta context topic, right? So I follow up just because I do the For You page. I get all the NBA Twitter shite because I've tweeted so much about the NBA myself, right? And one of the things that happened a few months, it was like about a month ago or something, was people were doing this thing where, because famously the one thing like LeBron doesn't have versus Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan won Defensive Player of the Year in 1988. And that's often considered the greatest season ever because he was like the scoring leader and he like won the dunk contest and he won, you know, who gives a fuck about that? But idiots put that in and he was Defensive Player of the Year and he was all defense and he was all NBA. So it's like an MVP. So he essentially had one like the, the craziest like win everything season. And obviously the one thing LeBron hasn't done is win Defensive Player of the Year. Even though, by the way, I've said this in the past, I also do think if you actually, we'll get into this in a second. I think absolutely there, there's a world where LeBron could have been the defensive player of the year in the early 2010s. Like, there was some seasons there he was cooking. And he definitely was trying. It wasn't like now where he phones it in or he lets you go past him. And he would actually take the challenge sometimes and guard the other best player. Like, he was doing everything he had to do. But I think, by the way, I think he got soured that he didn't win it. And famously, there was that year where it's like Marc Gasol won it instead of him or whatever the fuck. I think it was like 2013 or 2014 or something. And basically, so because they can't now make any more arguments for LeBron, now what they're trying to do, a la JJ Redick, is just unravel MJ's legacy, right? So what they did is a guy said, it was actually a famous guy in the NBA, it's like Joe something or other, some like writer. He said he'd researched Joe Horsebath or something like that. He said he'd researched and that when he went back to the 1988 season, listen already how each sentence I give makes this less sexy and interesting and actually diminishes the take. He said, I went back to that season and I watched six games, right, bro, that's like the opening sentence. I watched six games and in it, you know, the, like for example, the, the big smoking gun he claimed was, he said in one of the games, a home game, because his whole premise was based off the idea Jordan had way more steals and blocks at home than on the road. Guys, I've got a thing about the NBA to tell you about. I don't know if you know about American sports, but uh, but anyway, let's not get into that. That's obvious fucking joking, you idiot. Everyone plays better on the fucking home. But yeah, then his claim yeah. was that what they were really doing was fudging the numbers. That what they were doing was they were just giving Jordan every like debatable steal or assist. And so what he claimed is that there was a game where he looked it up and Jordan had like 11 steals, but then there wasn't even like 10 turnovers for the other team. So you know, it had to be false, right? This is right. where you will get infuriated, Maui. He wrote an article about this. He said all this. But because we live in the stupidest era in media, he didn't have like a video where he just showed you. He just said he'd looked into it. So what happened is every one of these fans has now repeated that for three weeks. And the new consensus uh. is that Jordan's numbers were fake and it wasn't it. Well, already, you can probably tell where this is going. A super fan already came along and took one of those games and looked at it and it wasn't even right. Like, actually, the guy, he had gotten this many in. And, like, I think that one, for example, that wasn't even true a stat that they had not that many turnovers. I, I don't know if this other guy lied, if he got it mixed up. Again, he didn't use footage as far as I know. But basically, yeah. it became a whole thing. So what's weird about this is, the reason I say we could back into, because we already did this discussion in the past about defensive player of the year, obviously with Rudy Gobert and all those guys, is what I think people are missing here is this. You actually, at least in that era, you didn't win it off fucking stats. Like the year before, Michael Jordan famously said he thought he should be defensive player of the year, be the year before, but they gave it to Michael Cooper of the Lakers because Michael Cooper was the defensive specialist. He was the Pat Beverly of his era, as it were, right? He wasn't yeah. like Kawhi Leonard, a superstar as well. He was just a defensive player who played really great defense and ran after everyone all the time. So what they, what people maybe don't know is they're trying to sort of get LeBron or take away a, a Jordan accomplishment by thinking stats will prove it one way or another. And I think what they're missing, Maui, is I not only in the in the old days does it not seem like stats are what you went off, which, I mean, it's logical. Like, people couldn't even see the games. You probably just go off what you feel. Like, you know, I feel like he's the best player. My eyes tell me he's pretty good. But I also think, I actually wish we go back to that, mate. I wish we, I've told you before, I actually think there are seasons where maybe Pat Bev should have won one. You know what I mean? Some of the times where it looked to me like he put the, his whole fucking ta engine and tank into defense at times, you know. I don't care about who has more blocks. Sometimes I care about, like, what does it look, who does it look like locks you down? Who does that? Yeah, because also the defensive stats are so one-dimensional because obviously what's diff what's what you're trying to do as a defensive player is deny your guy the ball. Yes. And you're also trying to, you sure, you're trying to block and steal. Like, yes, that's kind of like an ultimate. Oh, I see what you mean. You, those, you can't only but, use those two, right? It's a bit like, in. by the way, yeah. it's the same concept in American football. Defensive stats are very whack because it's like, did he get a sack or not? But there's a million times you can pressure the quarterback. He throws a bad throw, but you don't sack him. But you essentially made him throw, miss throw. Like, this, this, yeah, I, they have to, we need more, like, we need, like, more stats or some more, more advanced stats maybe for it's the like, defense. It's like when, when Richard 
Richard Sherman was the, you know, the when he was on the the Seahawks, he yes. was like basically good at ball denial, yes. a, a, essentially. And it's not like he's not getting interceptions all the time. No, no. He sometimes it's sometimes that he's so good on his assignment that that wide receiver is just taken out of the game. Yeah, you just the, don't throw the, it to his side. The joke is he doesn't yeah, get Q- stats because you don't throw to him. But that in itself is all exactly, right? yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's kind of like that's where that's where we're p- probably just kind of. I don't know if I don't know what, what like because there's been some stats that have been like closest man to assignment and percentage of shots there. But then I've also looked into that one too, and it's like, well, sometimes nobody's on the guy, and then yep. they just assign it to a guy that was yes. just like in the vicinity. You know, it's like no, the defense broke down, nobody was close to him. They got they got a layup, and then you just took the hit because it's like, well, that's I guess that's my guy because I'm the closest to him, and so but none of those stats are really always perfect either. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't as, know a, as a bigger yeah. topic, are you someone where what do you think about that angle? Like for this award, the sad thing is, I do feel like it will nearly always just go to the center that gets all the blocks and just rim protects. Like that's just the most obvious person it's... you give it to. Do you think they should give it to more perimeter players? What's your mm, feel? I feel like the the thing is that the defensive the center is going to have so much more impact, so much more regularly because. The center is always going to be able to guard more of the interior, and it's easier for him to just traverse the six, seven feet to in order to have an effect on that part of the floor. And that's the shot you want to take away the most. You want to take away two shots away in the NBA the most. You want to take away the corner three, and you want to take away the layup. And so if someone is like, you know, Gobert, he's going to take away more layups because you can't be on both corners at the same time as a perimeter player. And so, unfortunately, I would, I kind of... Ah, it's it sucks because it's like if if I had to pick somebody every single season to be the defensive player of the year, I almost would have to base off of that premise pick a center. But in reality, like yeah, I do I do value the the Pat Beverleys, the Kawhis, the the even the Jaden McDaniels for the for the Timberwolves. Oh, I was so sure. high on him yes. for this season, and then like yeah, obviously Jordan too, and like th- those guys when they when they lock in, they can do so much so well that it's almost like the interior offense can't even get activated because that guy that's on the perimeter is getting pressured so hard by Beverly, Jordan, what, who have you, that they can't even get the ball inside. So that that it's like your, your first line of defense is so strong because of those guys. But the problem is that they're not going to always defend the guy that has the ball on the perimeter yep, because the they're guarding another guy on the corner who, yes. to stop him from getting a free three. So it's a, it's a tough, it's a really tough one. And I'd have to like, I, like, and I'd have to really break it down. If I were if I were voting for that, I'd really have to break down my methodology for all of it out and like really lay it down, as opposed to just people that are like, uh, just give it to Gobert. You know, like I I feel like that's kind of how a few of these voters are, where they're just like, what's what's the common narrative? Uh, okay, Gobert, Gobert, Gobert. That's my number one. You know, because even though I myself have made the case for Gobert many times, I do think he's actually underrated. Same. By the way, Same. another reason I'll just throw in there that they don't like him. He's also French. I'll just put that out there. For whatever reason, that's a meme with Americans. It is with British he's people the, too. But just, he's the Zywoo of defense. Yeah, it's like you just want to hate him. That's just <laughs> it doesn't thing. Even, it no, no, it doesn't even make any sense. But you just no, make it, it doesn't, French. It doesn't at all. True. No, but, so, but the problem is, I do agree in general. But I do think the reason why I bring this topic up is the reason I think this has changed over time is the difference is the all-time great centers were playing the other all-time great centers as well. So they also were playing like the best yeah. player. I think in the modern day, it is a perimeter game. So as I say, as you say, there are certain stats, even though they have got slightly more advanced ones now that can't really cover if you just are really annoying or you stop the person getting the ball yeah. all the time like that's not a steal or a block is it like because the problem is i can deny you without getting the steal but i did my job and by the way if the person i'm denying is Kawhi leonard for jason tatum lebron these are the players that, that they're the players that are going to win the game like again like I, all i have to do in that scenario is i don't need crazy stats for me i just need them to get 15 less points or to fuck up the last two shots of the game if i do that i low-key might actually have been like the mvp of that game even though the stat line i'm never going to be the number one player so if fans are, are using an excel sheet i'll never win the award so i'm with you the problem is i think it's the i think unfortunately that award like i this is why i brought started with the jordan thing i think people think you can use stats i think people have a baseball mentality with all american sports whereas apparently yeah. people tell me baseball is the one sport you can do that with with the numbers i think the other ones are a lot this is like that award should be eye test in my opinion so i actually agree yeah. with going back to the old days you'd have to watch loads of the games to really know who the best player is in my opinion the best yeah. defensive yeah. player I, I i think i yeah defensive player of the year as dumb as it is i kind of uh it should be just sort of like a little bit of stats a little bit of narrative a, a lot of eye test that's kind of uh where i'm at with it you want to you want to do one over... last thing but i've got to eat after that Okay, okay. The last thing I wanted to just say, what do you think of um, 
Well, it's close to me, obviously, like the Clay Thompson to the Mavericks. Oh, by the way, yes, I, I should have put this on the list. I think that is straight fire. By the way, mm -hmm. do you know the most obvious move I would make, right? Here's where the GM of the Mavs doesn't fuck up as much as I implied. Look, I did say, even though people are going to say the finals is success, I'll say this. I actually called that I thought Kyrie Irving to the Mavs was a stupid move because it's like, bro, you want the ball all the time. What are you just going to be stood? And they do this. What is it? You're, like, he spends half his game like, yeah, great job, Luca. Just watching him like the best seat in the house, like, yeah. like some VR fucking position on the court. But that's not his game. Like, so in this scenario, like the one thing the GM did really, really well the last couple of seasons, even though he had to give up Brunson, the, the fucking ball handler, is he did get a lot of like uh, forwards and big guys who go to the rim and he can, and Luca can just pass it to them as he goes. He did a really good job with that. So here's what he needs now. And this is what Claire Thompson gives you perfectly. He needs spot up shooters. If you give Luca spot up shooters and he has those guys, mate, then he, is go he could win the ring now. It's not implausible. He'll have to do another mad carry performance, but I, I thought this season it wasn't possible to win. I actually think making the finals is the best they could do, but dude, I think that's a great move. And I also think people are doing this thing, Maui, where once a narrative is set, they don't rewrite the narrative when it needs to be. They're forgetting that at the beginning of that season, Claire Thompson was shit, and then he heated up over the last two seasons. Like yep. He kept having bad starts. Remember, he had like a 50-point game in one of these seasons, bro. Like He actually did eventually heat up, and his numbers went back to what they should be, sort of, bearing a match. So I, I think people are out on him for some reason and think he has to just stay with Curry. Like, I sort of like this move. If you're a Mavs fan, I think it's the dope move, man. I think he's going to get like a second lease of life. I actually think that one thing that Clay can bring beyond just the fact that what he brings, like just, just by sitting there with, and can potentially just get the ball, hit a three, is that he's got to tell Jason Kidd and the rest of the Mavs, Hey, by the way, when Luca's doing all this shit, we need to move around. Yes. Like we like this is not how we play basketball in 2024. It's not it's not four guys stand around and watch Luca just handle and do some shit. Yep. It's that give me a screen. Give me give me some motion so I can get open too. And so if Luca if Luca needs a, a release valve to to pass that ball off to, it's a guy that's open as a guy that's just been standing there for the last 15 seconds, which is what Luca so frequently does. He just, you know, he can't get separation from his guy and with 3 seconds left he just passes the ball he dumps the ball to some guy that's just been standing stationary and his guy's like like the guy that's defending the guy that luca passed the ball to in the corner can just go like like i've been here i had i didn't have to move at all i didn't move one bit and clay's just gonna be like no 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 we don't do that so i hope i i hope for clay's sake for the Mavs' sake that he brings that sort of stuff because i want him to just just raise his voice a little bit i want him to get open and so yeah no i think it's a great move because also clay just needed a change of scenery like like he had some great stretches, he had some bad stretches. He didn't know what his position was really on the team in terms of who, like who was he in the pecking order of shooting for the Warriors anymore? Because he's in the twilight years of his career, but he still is going to have a huge contribution. I see it being like this is potential for like if Luca wins his first championship, that Clay is going to have a Ray Allen type moment from when he was on the Heat. Yeah. And I'll just throw it in there. Look, I don't know after the injury where's motivation, but if he also does play at least some of the old Claire Thompson defense, that'll also level them up too. There's another player that can actually occasionally lock someone down or stay in front of someone. He used to move his feet pretty well.